بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the compassion the merciful We ask that he send peace and blessings upon our noble and our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives us of our sins large and small and that he count uh, this gathering for us and not against us We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for the goodness of this life and in the next and that he enter us into the highest of heavens without judgment so alhamdulillah, um, we wrapped up a section and we're actually even ahead of, uh, of where I thought we would be by about one lesson, which is good news. Um, this is the first time teaching this text, so it's good to kind of feel out. Um, so maybe you could teach it in about eight or nine sessions. It's pretty good. So we just finished up the section of Aqidah um, that in English, Sheikh Jihad calls divinity. Um, in Arabic, it's called ilahiyat, right? Al-ilahiyat, um, which is basically some of the obligatory matters that we need to believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and we took 20 attributes that are rationally necessary to believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what that means is that it's not just necessary by revelation. It's necessary by one's own rational thought, right? We didn't do a lot of that in this class because that's maybe a few stages above uh, where this group is. But just so you know, that is the case. Um, and then last week, for those of you who are with us, we talked about that those 20 attributes can be segmented into four uh, categories. So we said the attribute of existence, wujud, um, uh, is essentially its own category, which we call, does anybody remember what we call that category? There's, I think, three or four of you here. So anybody remember what we call the category under which is subsumed the attribute of existence? Yeah, the personal, uh, the, the personal attribute, um, some call it the self-signifying attribute. Nafsiya. I'm sorry, and nafsiya, thank you, great. And I wrote up a whole bunch of stuff for the other class, so I can just cut out the stuff that isn't necessary for this one and send that to you. Um, so that'll help you, inshallah, it's written in Arabic, it's transliterated, it's in English. Uh, so existence wujud is the personal attribute. There's only one attribute under that category. Then... There is uh, the second of the four categories, which is called, well, I'm not going to give you that. that uh, it has five attributes under it. It has beginninglessness, <coughs> endlessness, dissimilarity to created beings or dissimilarity to beings preceded by non-existence, self-subsistence, and oneness. What category is that called? Or what is the name of that category? Negate. Right. Attributes of negation. And uh, in Arabic, is salbiya. And if you take a step back, if you remember, we said one of the main things we have to believe about Allah, it's not an attribute, but one of the things we have to believe in is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any attribute of perfection, that's attributed to Him. And any attribute of imperfection, we disavow that from believing that about Him. Those attributes of negation that Adil just gave us the, the name of, those essentially are the most important things to negate attributes of imperfection about Him. But really, any attribute of imperfection, we negate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are like the ummahats, the main central ones. Okay, so now we've got two of the four categories, right? Category one was the personal attribute. Category two is the attributes of negation. And now we've, out of the 20, how many have we already dealt with now? Six. Six. So there are, right, the 14 others. The next seven are also in their own category. Omnipotent power, which in Arabic is qudra. Will which in Arabic is irada, knowledge, which in Arabic is ilm, life, which in Arabic is hayat, hearing, which in Arabic is sama, sight, which in Arabic is basar, and kalam, which in Arabic is speech. So those seven are in their own category. What category is that? Right, great. Uh, ad the qualitative attributes. Uh, yes, thank you, al-ma'ani. And in another English word, maybe you can see these attributes of meaning. And for those of you that were here or watched the video, I stress this point because of the nature of like these disciplines are slowly moving into English. If you don't know the Arabic, often it's going to be confusing. I'll tell you why. Because different authors are using different words for those attributes. So maybe that's an encouragement for you to learn Arabic um, or at least memorize those terms because... If somebody used attributes of meaning and you had learned it as qualitative, that might kind of throw you off if you're reading, right? Because they don't even sound alike, right? So how would you know that the two things are the same thing, right? 
And I'm not saying that those two English words are what the Muslim community is going to come to agree on long, long term, right? That's what's being employed now by the likes of Sheikh Jawad and Sheikh Omar and Sheikh Jihad and some of the other authors, Abdul Aziz Suraqa and others who are, are translating Aqidah text into English. Okay, the final category, because there's four, right? So we did uh, the personal attribute or self-signifying attribute, um, the attribute of negation, attributes of negation, uh, the uh, qualitative attributes or attributes of meaning. The fourth and final category has seven, seven attributes in them, and they all relate to the seven that came before. Such that Allah is almighty, qadir, all-willing, murid, all-knowing, alim, living, hay, all-hearing, samia, all-seeing, basir, and speaking, mutakallim. Now this category is called what? Predicative. Right, the predicative, right? That's right. And in Arabic, that's ma'nawiyah. Ma'nawiyah in Arabic, right? Now, that's 20. Now remember, at the very beginning of the class, brothers and sisters, we said, when studying these things, we're going to talk about what is necessarily true about Allah, impossible for Allah, impossible for Allah. So those 20 are the most important necessary ones. What about the impossible? Can someone summarize for me the impossible? They don't have to tell me each one. The opposite of all of them. So it's impossible for Allah to not exist. The attribute of non-existence is impossible. To have a beginning is impossible. To have an end is impossible. To see similar to created beings is impossible. To uh, be in need is impossible. To be multiple is impossible. To, be, uh, to lack power, be unable is, pos is impossible. To be forced is impossible. To be ignorant is impossible. To not have life or be dead is impossible. To be deaf is impossible. To be blind is impossible. To be mute is impossible. Right? All of those things are impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rationally. Right? Rationally are impossible for Allah. Okay, there is one category of attribute, there's one main attribute that they highlight that is possible for the divine. Does anybody know what that is? Go ahead, Brian. Anything that doesn't negate uh, his required attributes? Um, no, although that's true, but, um, uh, you know, it's an accurate statement, but that's not what they mention. Right, that Allah can create or not create any rashly possible thing. And remember here, be careful. What we mean by possible is not like what we see and what we're used to. What we mean is rationally possible, right? So we don't mean that flying. Allah could create us flying, right? But he didn't. Well, I guess we fly in planes. But he didn't create us as like a flying being out of when we're born, right? He could have created things very different than the way that they are. Those are all possible. What we mean is literally things that are impossible, right? And I'm just going to give you one example, and we're not going to push it a lot because it's at a beginning level. It's impossible to have a square that is a triangle, right? Because a square by its very definition is one thing, and a triangle by its very definition is one thing. So how can you have both? It's like playing around with words. You'd redefine the terms, which would negate the whole purpose of the exercise, <laughs> right? So if a square is not really a square anymore and a triangle is not really a triangle, well, fine, you can have something that's a square triangle, but that just defeats the whole purpose, right? That's an impossibility. You can't have something both exist and not exist, right? You can't have this microphone both be here and not be existent, right? Those are, right? Those are, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a play on words and it's, it's kind of a, a ridiculous assumption, right? Okay, great. So now... Alhamdulillah, we came to a close. We're moving on to a new section. Now we said in the study of Aqidah, generally, not always, but generally, Aqidah books are split into three sections. A section on Allah, a section on the prophets, and a section on matters we have to know that we heard from the prophets. Right? So the first one we call divinity, ilahiyat. The second section we call it nubuwat or prophetology. And the last section we call in English matters of faith or sam'iyat. Sam'iyat. Okay? So that's where we are in the text. So we're back to the text with Habib, uh, Habib Muhammad. Naam. So he says, prophetology and nubuwat. As-sifatul wajiba fi haqqa rusul alayhim as salam The attributes that we have to know by necessity concerning the messengers. May God's peace and blessings be upon all of them. 
and he says those necessary attributes for the in, with regards to the prophet with regards to the messengers excuse me um may god's peace and blessings be upon them are four attributes like in summary they're four we're going to go through each one but in summary they're four in summary they are four attributes and those four attributes are honesty which is the translation or the translation we use of the word sidq sidq like from the same root as Siddiq, Abu Bakr Siddiq. So Siddiq, honest, honesty. Number two, we're translating as trustworthiness. Trustworthiness, which is a translation of the word amana. You could say the sifa is al amana. Al amana. like from the name Amina or Amina. Three, we're translating as conveyance. Conveyance, which is a translation of the word tablir, a tablir. And fourth and finally, intelligence. Intelligence, which is a translation of the word fatana. Fatana. So honesty, sidq, trustworthiness, amana, conveyance, tabliq, intelligence, fatana. Right? Those are four necessary attributes of the prophets and the messengers. And some will say that those are all by rationality, and some will say some are by rationality, and some by... Regardless, those are the four that are mentioned in the Aqidah books, and they're, they're true regardless, right? Because we know them through revelation as well as through rationality. Yes, please. And some out of fifth, yes. Uh, yes, which one did you, uh, which fifth? Freedom from disgusting illnesses. Right, yes. And we'll talk about that under what is possible for them. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, so then the author says, because we're just following Habib Muhammad's book, May Allah uh, have blessings on his soul. After that, he says, the impossible attributes with regards to the messengers, right? They are four as well and they're i mean he doesn't say this but they're the opposites right so the opposites of those four that are impossible is one dishonesty which is the opposite of honesty right and that is a translation of the word al kadhib or kadhib two we're translating as treachery which would be the opposite of trustworthiness and there's a reason this word's being used as opposed to untrustworthy. This, what, I guess there's no untrustworthiness. Not trustworthy, I guess. So treachery is the word that we're using. Khiana. Khiana. We're going to take the definitions of these and what they mean, etc. We're just going through the list. Three, the opposite of conveyance is concealment. That's impossible for the prophets. Which in Arabic, the Arabic word is kitman. Kitman. And fourth and finally, feeble-mindedness. Al-balada, balada. So dishonesty, kadhib, treachery, khiana, concealment, kitman, feeble-mindedness, balada. These four are impossible for the messengers and the prophets. Okay? All right, great. So we'll keep going with our author. Then he says the one possible attribute that he's conveying to us about the messengers and the prophets, may God's peace and blessings be upon them, is any human state, any human state that does not lead to a shortcoming or like an imperfection from their high rank. So that's possible. For example, he gives an example in the text, eating, drinking, um, illness that does not cause people to flee from them. Walking in the marketplaces, marriage, right? So those things are all possible for the prophets. Now, it's interesting that in the Quran, some of them said they would accuse the Prophet ﷺ, and the Quran dealt with this, saying like, well, he eats and drinks like the, the rest of us, right? Or like, why doesn't he send us an angel, right? Well, Allah's not saying the Prophet ﷺ is an angel, he is 
maybe angelic in his qualities, right? But he is a, he's a human. He's 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 um, he's a he, best of humans, the best of creation. He's human, but he's unlike other humans in that you know he's unique and he's special. Ali Afdal Salah, what to see? Okay, great. So that's what we got. Four necessary, four impossible, one possible. Right, of course, that's not everything. That's just the most important ones that they're what? They're conveying in the text. So let's now go through each one of those necessary attributes and talk a little bit about what the Quran says about that. So the first one, as-sidq, honesty, our author says. Honesty. And basically, Habib Muhammad says, what is honesty? It's when the person's, the, the thing that a person's telling you actually is matches up to reality right so the khabar the 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 subject excuse me the predicate of what they're saying to you right they're saying you know this microphone exists that that microphone in reality what exists right brad is in the room that that means brad is actually what in the room that's what honesty is so this means that everything that they've told us, the prophets and the messengers, may God's peace and blessings be upon them, right, actually is true. It matches to reality. Right? Now, I'm just going to move away from the translation for a second. Because a person might believe something is true, but it's not what? It's not true. So I might actually think it's true, right? but it might not be true, right? So we're saying not only do they believe it to be true, that it is in reality what actually the case. The, the opposite of that is, is lying, right? The opposite of that, dishonesty. And that's with when you communicate something that's what? Not in its reality, the case. So lying is impossible for the sake uh, in, in regards to the prophets and the messengers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet ﷺ, after a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Your companion Muhammad is neither in error, nor is he deceived, nor does he speak out of passion. This is but revelation that is revealed. And it's not just talking about the Qur'an, it's talking about everything that he says. The Qur'an says elsewhere, elsewhere, excuse me, um... Let the truthful ones be asked about their truthful, truthfulness. Right? And elsewhere in the Quran, um, let me just highlight this, gotta go back to it. Um, the, 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 the next verse um, that we wanted to share with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa Allahu wa rasuluh. Allah says that Allah and His Messenger were truthful. Okay. Realize what's happening here. We're proving that this attribute is true. So in the Quran it says Allah and His Messenger were truthful. So how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that? And then we say بلاد, that they're not truthful. Right. Okay. So that's one of uh, uh, of of the attributes. Now we should know that, that that's really an important attribute to reflect on for us as human beings because it means that everything the Prophet ﷺ told us is true. Okay, think about this. That means when he says things like, if you say this dhikr, you will not be harmed. So a person might say that and not believe it and that might lead to them not, that it, them still being harmed because they're not, they're not approaching it with what? With actual belief. Right? They don't believe what's coming to them from the Messenger of Allah. So, whatever the Prophet Sallallahu told us is true. Now, as Shaykh Abdul Karim was mentioning in the last class, and we'll kind of just merge uh, to the conversations a little bit. The Prophet Sallallahu told the Sahaba everything that was going to happen. There's a hadith where he says, and I forget the number, I think he said, I forget, I don't want to say wrongly, but he says like a small number of people. He said there wasn't a leader of like a small group of people except that the Prophet said him told us his name, right? There's a hadith, it's a beautiful hadith, and he says that after Fajr, the Prophet said him got up and preached to us until Dhuhr. And then we prayed Dhuhr, and then he preached us to Asr. And then we prayed Asr, and then he preached to us till 
uh, Maghrib. And we pray, he, he preached to us until Isha, etc. Right? They prayed all five prayers. And he said, he told us everything that would happen from our time until the Day of Judgment. And then he said, those of us who remember, remembered, and those who of us forgot, forgot, and those who remember the most are the most knowledgeable amongst us. Right? And it's interesting because some of those hadith, according to hadith science, they're not necessarily the strongest in veracity in their chain. But if you go back to them now and look at what's happening now, it matches almost word for word. So that shows you that even something that's weak that doesn't in its chain doesn't mean that it's not true. How would this match up exactly? I mean, match up exactly. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, even things that are like almost predictions of what would occur, right? Um, all of that is true. And that should really impact us. So we should be seeking that type of truth. Not just looking for predictions of the future, right? But we should be saying, well, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? We should be listening, right? Remember in Toji, when uh, the class that you, uh, some of you do uh, at the end of the, uh, some of you stay after, you know, have, uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim is reading from that book. And, you know, he says, you know, there are echoes of reverberate, there are reverberating echoes from uh, the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu and from the Qur'an. We're hearing people talking to us about those meanings and that should impact us. We should be thinking about that. So in summary, the Prophet Ali is what? He is honest. And all the Prophets and the Messengers are honest and truthful. Right? All right. The next one is trustworthiness or amana. Trustworthiness or amana. Flip back to the Arabic. So, Habib Muhammad says trustworthiness or amana. Look, this is not defined. This is not necessarily the first definition that's going to come to your mind. So please pay attention to the definition. It is their infallibility, outwardly and inwardly, from being treacherous in their actions being treacherous in any forbidden action, excuse me, or uh, offensive, legally offensive action, or even doing not what's best. Meaning that the messengers, it's impossible for them, they're infallible. They would never, they could never do an action that's prohibited, an action that's offensive in the law, or even something that is less than what is best. Right, and what less than what is best is a legal category. We don't mean like in the in the uh, uh, the common parlance. So there's a lot to learn about this, but let's do a couple of hadith and verses of Quran, and then we'll come back to uh, we'll come back to some of the issues that are probably coming to your mind. Right. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, and they indeed sought to entice you, O Muhammad, from what we revealed to you, hoping that you you might for some other scripture, you might follow some other scripture in our name. Then they would have accepted you as a close friend. And had we not strengthened you, you would almost have inclined to them just a little. In that case, we should have made you taste the double punishment in this life and in the next. Then you would not have found, then you would have found none to protect you from us. Now the Arabic doesn't translate into the English because the, the, the phrasing of the Arabic is walawla, right? And so this is saying that it's impossible. This would never happen. But this is the, what they had hoped would occur. But it's impossible. You would never have done that. Right? Because of how we created you. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says about the Prophet Rahim. Say if you truly love Allah, follow me and, and, and Allah shall love you and forgive you your sins and Allah is most forgiving the merciful. Now think about this. Allah is telling us that to love him we should follow the Prophet And all of the companions of every Prophet had to follow their Prophet. And this was their commandment. So it's impossible that the prophets and the messengers would be treacherous doing stuff what's forbidden, what's offensive. How could they do that? And Allah is telling us to do what? Follow them. How is it plausible that we could be commanded to follow a prophet or a messenger and then that prophet and messenger do what? Do the opposite of what Allah is telling us to do. Right? It's irrational. Right? It's impossible. It's implausible. So, you know, uh, our brothers and sisters of other faith traditions, we reject what they say about the prophets and the messengers, right? Because they say pretty horribly offensive things about things that they've committed, right? They're totally untrue, right? We don't accept that as a, as a, as our religion doesn't accept that, Allah doesn't accept that, and it's not true about them. It's a lie on their, about them. 
Uh, and Allah says elsewhere in the Quran, وَاتَّبِعُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ And follow him, so perhaps you may be guided. Again, how do you follow someone who's doing something that is what? Not, not the right thing to do. Naam. And then look at this verse of Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-A'raq, قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Say, indeed, Allah does not order vileness, or um, corruptness, or obscenity. Right? Are you saying about Allah that which you don't know? Right? How could you say that a prophet or messenger would do that? Thus, that would mean what? That Allah is commanding you to do something that's obscene. Right? Impossible. Impossible. So, this is important because what it's telling us is that, first of all, one issue we have to deal with, the, a lot of the other uh, religious traditions believe things about the prophets that we reject. Things like them doing forbidden, prohibited things. Impossible. T second point that's related to this. Anything that we see in the hadith or the Quran that seems to indicate that the prophet or another prophet did something that was, God forbid, forbidden or um, uh, um, offensive or less than best. All of that has to be understood in the context of our theological tradition. And most of it has a backstory, right? Most of it has a backstory. And any time when the prophet is asking for forgiveness or a prophet's asking forgiveness, the way that the ulama understand that is they say that they're all positive levels and they're just constantly an increase, right? And sometimes they're holding themselves to higher account than Allah's holding them to account, right? Holding their own selves to account higher. And there are entire books written on how to deal with these verses of Quran and these ahadith. For example, uh, the, the book that's translated into English, Our Master Muhammad by Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin, it's not about this, it's, it's Shama'il, but he actually deals with a lot of these cases about the Prophet ﷺ specifically. But there are entire books written about, for example, the story of Sayyidina Adam, the story of Sayyidina Yunus, uh, the, the, the uh, story of Sayyidina Nuh, um, the story of the Prophet ﷺ with Abbasa and these types of things. And all of them deal and try to, look, you're misunderstanding this. And this is one of the things that's really problematic with approaching the text without teaching. Because if you approach the text, you're actually reading into the text, right? The idea that you're coming somehow like objectively to the Quran, that's not true, right? So if you're misunderstanding the text, that's on you or on me. That's not on Allah, And part of it is it's a test, right? Do you believe this about the prophets and the messengers or do you not, right? Um, and so the text isn't itself veering you in another direction. It's not. The text doesn't carry that, right? But it's you who might be bringing something to the table. So you have to be able to understand those things um, in, in, in their, proper, their proper way. For example, I'll just use one example because we don't have a lot of time. With Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. With Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam, somebody could read the text and think, oh, he sinned by eating from the tree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him uh, not to, right? One, the verses about that are not all the same. In some of the verses, it's very clear that he forgot. So one verse, the, the word signifies sin with our common man understanding. And in another verse with our common man understanding, the word signifies forgetfulness. And what the ulama tell you is actually that word for sin actually also means to forget. It's one of its Arabic meanings. Right? So, Taysir is not an Arabic master. Right? Taysir learned Arabic with his mom and his dad. So, if he reads the Quran and misunderstands that, that's on who? That's on Taysir. Right? Right? So, learning is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. Right? It's incredibly important that we don't believe wrong things about the prophets and the messengers because they're free of all of those accusations against them. Right? Okay. So that's two out of the four, right? We did honesty and we did trustworthiness, right? So the next one is tabligh, conveyance, conveyance. And that is that they teach 
and they convey to the people all of what they've been obligated to convey from the Sharia and the legal rules of the religion. Okay, so stop for a second and, and, and focus with me. Allah told the prophets and the messengers, you have to convey X, Y, Z, this category of things. Yarhamkallah. Does that mean that they have to convey everything they were told by Allah? No. Because certain things they were told by Allah and they weren't commanded to convey it. In fact, as you'll come to see, prophets that are not messengers, that's one of the main points of their definition, the definition of that term, which is that they're ones who have revelation but are not conveyed, not commanded to what? Convey it. Now, the prophets, for example, let's take the Prophet said as an example. He conveyed that which is obligatory to convey to everyone, to the people. Right, not to everyone, but to the people. He conveyed it. There were certain things that he was not commanded to convey, but he conveyed to what? To certain people. So there are hadith, let's say Ibn Ali, for example, عنه, where he would say, is there a stranger amongst us? And they'll say, no. he says, shut the door. Right? And he'll, be, he'll begin to, to preach to them. Or for example, he would tell them, say, la ilaha illallah after me. Right? And actually, some of the ulama used to do that. Imam al-Junaid used to do that. Junaid ibn Muhammad, uh, the, the great sheikh of the salaf, he would say, look, is there anybody amongst us who's strange? They say, no. He says, shut the door. Right? And, and he would begin to teach him because not everything you want to teach to everyone. It's not like a secret because none of it goes against the religion. Right? Let me give you an example, okay? Like in our other theology class. Like we're starting to do stuff that is a little bit, you know, difficult. If we just started teaching random people that, what do you think that's going to do? Confuse them. They're going to say, what is this? They'll start to have doubts about their religion. Right? That's just from a, a discipline perspective. That's just from a discipline perspective. Sayyidina Abu Huraira. Uh, عنه, he was known for writing the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So he would actually keep um, like boxes of, of, of a hadith that he had written. right? And he said to them, he said, look, I shared with you half of them. If I shared with you the other half, they'd slit my throat. <laughs> right? In other words, things that like they're not going to understand. Right? They're not going to understand. And none of that contradicts the religion. Don't let your mind go anywhere. Right? It's just, it's beyond just maybe the basics. Right? Teaching us more. And you see that now. Like with social media, one of the problems that we've got with it is like we're putting stuff out there and actually have a word for it now. They call it context collapse. Right? So, like, you know, uh, you might be speaking about something and somebody in another part of the country who has nothing to know what you're talking about thinks it's about something that has to do with them. And then they'll start engaging you on it. Right? So, the Prophet said was the best teacher. He taught people where they were. You know, if a man comes to the Prophet and he says, look, I heard that if I pray the five prayers and I don't pray anything else, that I'll go to heaven. And he said, yeah, that's, if you did that, it's true. He's like, yeah, you will. He said, okay, I'm not going to do anything else. <laughs> he said, well, if he's honest and he does that, you know, inshallah. But that man, is that man the same level as the same of Sayyidina Abu Bakr? Come on. You know, the man who, radiallahu anhu, sat with him in the, in the, in the cave protected him from being stung, like that's not the same man, right? It's not the same. So Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Wajha, the Prophet ﷺ said about him, he said that I am the city of knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ said. I am the fortress of knowledge. And Ali is its gate, right? Meaning if you want knowledge, go through Sayyidina Ali, right? And if you notice Almost all, not all, but almost all of the spiritual links back to the Prophet ﷺ are through Sayyidina Ali. With the exception of, of one very well-known and accurate one. Right? They're all through Sayyidina Ali. Right? Okay. So that's, uh, we got to do a few of the verses about that. And we got to keep going because we don't want to run out of time for what I'm supposed to cover today. So conveyance. Conveyance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ the messenger's duty is nothing but to convey clearly. Right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabarak alladhi nazzal al-fulqan ala abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadira. Blessed is he who has sent down the criterion, meaning, meaning the Qur'an, to his slave, meaning the Prophet sallam, that he may be a warner to the worlds. 
And then the well-known verses of Quran, Oh Prophet, we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good news and a warner and as a summoner to Allah by his permission and as a lamp that gives light and announce to the believers the good news that they will have great favors from Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِّرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And we have sent you but as a giver of good news and a warner to all people, but most people do not know. And then look what Allah says about the Prophet. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ He does not withhold the unseen. And Allah says about the religion of Islam, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Today I've completed for you the religion. So how can we say some is hidden and Allah is saying, look, the religion's been complete. Allah is saying that. And Allah says, قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّشْدُ مِنَ الْغَيْ The right course has become clear from the wrong. And then in the farewell, uh, the farewell sermon, it's well known. Uh, the Prophet says, uh, sorry, he says, um, after mentioning a lot of stuff to save time, we won't read the whole thing. He says, Allahumma hal ballaght. Allahumma hal ballaght. Right? So he says, have I conveyed the message? Right? He kept saying that the Prophet said, to Allah. And in one narration, he says it to the people. Have I conveyed the message to you? And they reply, yes. He said, oh, Allah, bear witness. Let the one present inform the one absent. How many recipient understands more than the one absent? For how many recipient understands more than the one who hears directly? Right? And that's in Bukhari. That's in Bukhari. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ conveyed everything. Tarakna, the hadith says, Al Mahajat al Baydah. Right? He left us on the on the on the on the clear path. Its night is like its day. What does that mean? Like it's night isn't meaning that it's as clear in the night as it is in the day. All right, let's do the last one. And it looks like we didn't get to one part that I want to get to, but that's okay because I think the next lesson will be light anyway. Um, so the last one, which is fatana. Fatana we're defining as intelligence or translated as intelligence. And it means that he has... The prophets have the epitome or the perfection of intelligence, cleverness, being alert. So that they can, and this is a really tough word to translate, but like, you know, when your two parties are, are debating and one part really kind of hammers it home to the point that the other, the other opponent has no way out. That's ilzam. There's got to be a philosophical word for it, but I don't know what it is. But ilzam. It's like you force them. They got no other position except to admit defeat, right? So their intelligence and their cleverness allows them that when they're engaging with somebody, whether it be in a discussion or a debate, that they can what? That they can pin them down, right? And that they can show the incorrectness and the faulty logic of their opponent, right? And the Prophet did sometimes, it was rare, but he did sometimes engage in a back and forth. Right? It's well, I don't know if you guys know, there's a well-known story of one of the uh, groups that had come to visit the Prophet from one of the other religions. And basically, he told them, he said, okay, you know, they, they engaged them and he clearly, you know, uh, was defeated. And then he said, you know, if, why don't you say, like, I'm going to swear by Allah that what we're coming with is true. And if we're not telling the truth, then may Allah curse us. And I'll bring my family and I'll swear by Allah that what I'm saying is true. And if it's not true, then Allah will curse me and my family. And then they saw him coming with like his daughter Fatima and his son-in-law Ali. And then, and then they were like, guys, like, look, we really, this is, this is getting really dangerous. Like we can. And then they decided not to. Right? Because they, they, they knew that, look, he's on the truth. Right? They knew that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was telling the truth. And uh, wittiness is one of, yeah, definitely. He was definitely witty, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And he was, he was able to speak to people where they are. And you'll notice in Aqidah, um, one of the things that's very important is that when you learn proofs, you don't 
overshoot because it'll just cause people doubts, right? You actually, Ghazali says that uh, mutakallim has to be like a doctor, and he only gives people what they need. Um, anyhow, there are a lot of, and I don't have with me right in front of me right now, but there are a lot of evidences of the Prophet's intelligence. Um, and a great book to go to is that same book that I had mentioned to you, Our Master Muhammad, um, Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah. There's a whole section on the intelligence of the Prophet. He was very, very, very intelligent, and the prophets and the messengers are intelligent. Let's use an example, the example of Sayyidina Ibrahim. For example, Sayyidina Ibrahim, they, they had the idols. What did he do? He waited till they left the town. He destroyed the idols. He put the, the axe slash hammer in the hand of the big one. And they said, Oh, Abraham, are you the one who destroyed our idols? They had heard him saying that he was going to destroy the idols. And he was a young man. He said, the big one did it. It's the one that's it's still carrying it. <laughs> right? And then they were like, oh, well, now we feel really kind of sheepish, right? They didn't know what to say because they know, what are they going to say? That there's no way he could? <laughs> right? And then also, it's well known, his back and forth with another group of people when they were, they were, they were worshiping the constellations. And he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship. Th this this uh, star is my God. And then it disappears. And he says, you know, I don't like things that disappear. He said, oh, okay, this one's my God. The moon's my God. The sun's my God. And then he said, look, my people, I'm innocent from what you believe in. Right? Like, look at that. That's like common sense. He didn't come with like philosophical arguments. Again. He could have. With, say, uh, with uh, Nimrod, right? With the leader, he told them, who is your Lord? He said, my Lord is the one who brings, gives life and takes it. So look at the, 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 the stupidity of, of the leader. He said, okay, I do the same thing. He brought two slaves. He said, he can live, kill him. So Sayyidina Ibrahim said, he's the one who raises uh, the sun, right? He's the one who raises the sun from, from the east and sets it in the west, right? And he said, uh, uh, can you raise it from the west and set it in the east? And he said, فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَى So the one who denied, he was silent. There's nothing he could do. Right? And so some amount of that is okay. Now, the religion of the Prophet is not a religion of argumentation. It's not. We have to be very clear that it's not. However, there is a role for that. There is a role for using some amount of intelligence to convey to people. Right? You know, you say Jesus, the son of Mary, is the son of God because he has a mother and no father. Well, tell them, the Quran says, that Adam has no mother or no father. Right? And to Allah, it's all the same. Right? Now, if you do that kindly, that could be useful. And sometimes you shouldn't do it at all. There is, a, or there is a role for some people in the community to have a stronger um, spot of arguing certain positions because you need that so that truth can be clear. That there's someone defending the truth. But we shouldn't be argumentative. The way of the shiuch is that they clarify. Right? So for example, we shouldn't be sitting here Theological group A, theological group. Let's you know uh, discuss them. Look at them. They're so you know they're so unintelligent. Oh, how could they say this? They're all heretics. You know X, Y, and Z. No, we don't need to do that. We just clarify the positions. Clarify the positions. That's all we need to do. Right? Great. So uh, we're gonna stop there, inshallah, and take questions, and then inshallah we'll have another short section on the prophets and the messengers uh, next week, and we'll probably move into uh, matters of faith. Um, either in that lesson or the lesson that's after that, inshallah. And wrap up. I think today is, is today day seven? Yeah. Yeah, it's week 11, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's session seven. Yes. Yeah, it's session seven. Right. Yeah, because we took a bunch of breaks and stuff. So, so anyway, we were supposed to finish in nine. We might finish in eight, eight and a half, right? So probably nine sessions, but one of the sessions might be a little short. Right? So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and I and give us uh, goodness of this life and the next. Let's take a few questions. We have like six minutes. So if anybody has a question, I can take it at this point. Um, inshallah, we'll be able to answer it. Please go ahead. So are these um, four character traits ones that are more obligatory on us to follow? Um, to be more That's a very good question. Um, we're obligated to follow the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, in all traits that, that are for us and not unique to him. So there are certain things that are, that are mentioned in the books about the unique attributes of the Prophet. Um, you know, for example, the Prophet would 
fast, a fast that did not involve breaking it at nighttime. He would just keep fasting. So when some of the Sahaba said, like, we're going to do the same thing, he said, no. He said, Allah feeds me and quenches my thirst in ways that he doesn't do for you. Right? Um, he married more than four. That's, that's not allowed for, for, for Muslim men. Right? Um, um, uh, and, and there are other things like that. Now, we're not infallible. So we should try to be honest, of course, but we can't actually reach infallibility. Even sainthood, which is a bad translation of the word uh, wilaya, right? Even when they reach a level that Allah grants them, that protects them from sin, they're still capable of falling into it. Prophets are actually incapable of it, right? So uh, a, a, a wali could actually, unfortunately, right, fall from his position of proximity to Allah. Prophets can't. Right, um, so we should try. Right, all of those attributes are true. Any attribute, even with the attributes of Allah, they'll say, of course, you can't be like Allah, but you're supposed to what? Try to understand that attribute, what that means for you. Right, and there's certain ones that are off limits. Right. Any other questions? We have like three minutes, so if you have a question, please ask. Adil, go ahead. I don't know if I want to bring this up. Maybe if you want, <laughs> okay, no worries. If you want to shut it down. Sure, no worries. Um, can you say that some of these, I mean, it's like a, it's a vast generality that it's like the majority of the case that is true, but unless there were some certain specific instances that would cause it to be otherwise because like Allah wanted to show something? Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying and, and, and others might not um, because of, of how much you've studied or not. Um, and there's two ways to look. I've heard some of the shiuch say that, but you know, like the shiuch that I rely on for 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 this discipline, they I don't think they would ever say that. They would say no, it's the case. And if it seems otherwise to you, there's something else going on, right? So for example, um, there's the well-known case of Sayyidina Ibrahim uh, Ali Salam, quote lying unquote, right? Um, telling an untruth, right? What seems like an untruth, but as you research the story and you look into those books, what they say is that's not actually what happened. He wasn't actually, he wasn't actually lying, right? So, go ahead. With his wife. Yes. Right, with his wife. That was one of the cases, right? And then with the breaking of the, the breaking of the idol was one of them as well, right? Um, so, you know, I think some of them do say that. I've heard them say that, right? Because these books, and I think we should get these books translated because I think it's very important because what's happened in America particularly both for Muslims who grew up Muslim and those who converted, is we've basically inherited biblical stories, right? Whether we like it or not, all of us have, right? If you watched cartoons, you inherited biblical stories. If you went to public schools, you inherited biblical stories. Like it's just part of, part of society, right? Um, and so sometimes actually your mind is rewriting your memory on this, right? So I think it's going to be really great to get some of these things translated and then also written into... I think there are people already doing this. I think there's a few people writing kind of the stories of the prophets in English so that they're accessible. Sheikh Faraz is teaching a class on it, um, which I, inshallah, will have a chance to, to, to go through. Um, uh, yeah, I'll not comment about other stories about the Prophet So you should stay away from other videos and DVDs. So. Any other questions? <laughs> you had another question, last one. Uh, that's a really good question. I don't know. Okay. So you're saying for the person who's online, because the person who's online doesn't have their name, so I don't know who it is, but um, uh, you're saying that because in the Prophet Sallallahu case, when that happened, basically they knew that his his life was coming to an end, right? And Sayyidina Ibn Abbas actually noted that, right? Um, some of those verses that had to do with the religion being completed. Um, whether that's a rule or not, I honestly, I don't know. Um, and I would need to look into it. Maybe Sheikh Abdul Karim comes, but I think that's a, that's a good question to ask. Any other questions? I think that's a good place to stop. We're right on time. Um, and, you know, inshallah, we'll next week um, return to the last few matters about the messengers and the prophets, including the names of the prophets and the messengers. Um, and then, inshallah, we'll move on from that um, to, uh, uh, we'll move on to that to matters of faith. Samayat. No, no, end up, end up, end up, end up.
حضرة النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الفاتحة 